think we do have a quorum, so I think we can call the meeting to order. The uh, May 8th, 2019 uh, meeting of the Granby Inland Wetlands and Water Courses Commission. Um, we do, like I said, we do have a quorum. Our agent is not here at the present time. She will be here. Um, she suggested that if any of us had uh, any question, or, or would you like to make your presentation first? Sure, uh, that could be very brief. And then you know, could you, could you come up here and sure. state your name and uh, who you're representing for the record, please? Sure. My name is uh, George Logan. I'm a soil and wetland scientist. I've been before this commission for a while, so I remember some of your faces. I'm here representing Mr. Witte. Uh, he's uh, retained me to uh, put forth a restoration plan for the, I mean, for the activity that took place uh, along the water courses and, and uh, wetlands without permit. Um, Earlier this uh, afternoon, uh, Kate had asked me to send her the application fee form of what I thought was going to be the, the proper, which is a little confusing for me, but anyhow, I did the best that I can, so I sent it to her, and she'll probably have an opinion when she gets here as to what the fee would be. Um, surprised my client's not here. He was, I thought, supposed to be here, but anyhow, we can proceed without him at this point. Um, my involvement goes back to, I believe, February or so. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, my first order of business that Kate had asked me to do is first to delineate the weapons. Obviously, um, I couldn't do the delineation during the winter. We had some issues with snow, ice, and the rest. So it, it waited a little bit when the conditions were a little more favorable. So in, on April 6, I visited the property. Uh, did the delineations as requested. Um, some of that basically is pre-existing wetland boundaries that were obvious, uh, and some were presumed wetland boundaries or boundaries that are obvious now. So for instance, when we talked about the little pond, as you recall, by the way, I don't know if you, or you didn't, so I'm going to give you a colored version of the map that might be a little more helpful. <coughs> and I have extra copies of the report if you need them, but that's fine. F. This. So it's in the apartment here. Oh, that's the actual time. Just because it's burned. Yeah. 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 What's obvious here is that what I didn't do is, since I'm not a surveyor, is go out and survey the exact point. So the best thing that I could do at the time uh, is use my GPS on my phone, which I have a very nice aerial photograph, which is exactly this one. Um, and so within plus or minus 11 feet, I'm able to pinpoint where the flags are. So that's one thing that I do, so I get screenshots of that. And then once I'm done with the delineation, I turn the machine on and track it. So I just start walking the line with the phone in my hand, and that's very, very helpful. And then, <coughs> so this is the best that I could do. I'm trying to be conservative here towards the wetlands and the water courses. So as you can see from this little plan, what we ended up with, obviously the, the large wetland impact is the wood chip roadway to the back. I estimate that's about 2,500 square feet of, of wetland disturbance. I'm looking at the aerial photographs, both this and a few others, including older archival quality ones that I get off uh, the Yukon or the uh, Connecticut State Library's websites. My thought was that, for the most part, with probably a minor exception along the southern edge, uh, what this wood chip uh, roadway did is impacted a pre-existing wet meadow, and it was right at the edge of it. I was able to find uh, soils on the other side of the berm. Obviously, I couldn't go through the berm because it's about three and a half feet deep in places. So this is my best estimation. So you can see that blue line 
swoops around because I was able to find soils, wetland soils on both sides in most cases, which was convenient <laughs> for me. And then I was able to, to pace it, get an average, and give you the 2,500 square feet. Um, the second thing that I did is I delineated around the pond. The pond itself, and I did it both in the field by pacing and also by the aerial photographs, is approximately 2,350 square feet. It's about four and a half deep, feet deep at, the, at, at its lowest point, probably averages. Three, three, about three feet or so. I think it used to be deeper, but I, I believe that the, 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 the pipe that discharges from the pond has been lowered or something's been done to it. I, I, Kate might remember what that is. But anyhow, um, there's an obvious berm that's holding some water back. So there's been excavation and berming. So some of it, the water that's there is based on water being held back by the berm at the pipe at the invert, and the rest has been excavated. Um, I estimated it by noticing undisturbed soils on the upper side and then on the lower side, about where the wetland probably used to be. And this is an estimate that the pond has increased the regulated area of water course by about 570 square feet. So if you imagine that the stream corridor used to do something like this, actually it goes out at one point, and the pond kind of did something like this. So the strips on each side are 700 square feet of, of additional regulated area. Um, also, and this was again an estimate, I did include this in the report, but then I looked at the, uh, at the fee schedule, I'm like, okay, this category I did miss. Um, was that there was in the process of coming to do the pond, uh, my client passed through some wetlands. Thankfully, he hasn't disturbed the soils enough so that it's changed the conditions, still a wetland. But in doing so, I think some shrubbery kind of disappeared, a few small trees <laughs> disappeared because of the, it looks unnaturally open under story. So I approximate, you know, about 500 square feet of that happened within um, the wetland, I think, and then additional 500 square feet outside of the wetland within the upland review area. Now, the, the pond itself, even though it's still a regulated area, I believe what my calculation said is that you have about a little over 1,700 square feet of disturbance in doing that. So if you tally everything together, you had somewhere between 5,000 square feet and 5,100 square feet of total disturbance within wetlands. I looked at the stream itself. It doesn't have a tremendously large watershed, but it goes up the hill fairly steeply. It's about 175 acres of watershed. That's based on USGM street stream stats uh, and utility that's, on, that's online, which is very helpful. Um, I observed everything that I would observe in the perennial stream, which this is. Uh, mayflies, caddisflies, leeches, snails, other things. I did see some pangolin fish, and uh, they were getting away. Uh, they were sort of variegated, and I think there was a brook trout, and there was a couple of other species of fish in there. So it's an aquatic, uh, fairly well-functioning aquatic system, at least above the pond. As it gets to the pond and below, uh, the stream, you basically lose the stream about 50 feet below the pond itself from this more rocky, stony uh, kind of habitat and gets into that uh, larger marsh, which you see in this picture, uh, marsh, scrub, shrub. And it's, you know, if you look at the old aerial photographs, you, it becomes very obvious that it was ditched. Um, the farmer probably at some point said, okay, enough of that. I'm going straight line. As a matter of fact, uh, <coughs> here's, hey, here's a 1965 aerial photograph of the site. You can pass it along. Um, our pond is somewhere there. So that's the street. We can see it's called straight line. 
Okay. So, yeah. So the stream is it's, nice yeah, above. Yeah. The the wetland is is at least morally functioning below it. Um, the only invasive species that I saw is usually what you find at the edge, just outside of the wetlands, multiflora rose, plenty of that. And the only species of, well, if you consider re-canary grass as an invasive species, you've got plenty of that there. And that's that beige color that you see there. But it's, it's all kinds of other things in there. There's a little purple moose stripe, but not, not that much. So it's, it's a good system. So what I did recommend are several things. Some of that I recommended would happen fairly quickly because of the season, we don't want to lose time. Um, let me back up a little bit. Um, one of the discussions I had with Kate is to pond or not to pond. And my view was, based on what I saw, that there's a higher risk for us to try to recreate the stream the way that it exactly was before. You have a pond. I don't like the fact that the pond has steep, steep edges. So one of the recommendations that I made, made is from the edge of the pond to relax the slope back to three to one. Now it's in some cases one to one. It's steep, so uh, you can't plant that well either. So that's one of the things that I recommend. Uh, putting erosion sensitization control at the edge of, of, of the water and then relaxing topsoiling, seeding immediately. Uh, those areas. Obviously, the, the wood chip berms would have to come off, but I would have them do the work at the pond first and then back out of there. Uh, I also noticed that uh, there's a few logs below the wood chip berms. It's probably the initial course of stability that was laid down and then the wood chips on top of that. And it's come in some areas, it's kind of sag and then we continue to sag. Um, so the idea would be relax the slope at the pond, topsoil and seed. We'll talk about some other things in a, in a bit as far as other, other vegetation. And then what uh, Kate recommended is to take out the actual pipe. Now right now you have almost like a little path. It's eight or nine feet wide. It's the burrow. And there's a pipe underneath. And uh, Kate wanted and I agree with that, is to take out the culvert, note where the elevation of where the invert of the pipe is right now, so remember that, whatever it is. Um, take out some material so that you have at least the 15, maybe more, 20 foot swath. Um, so here comes your herb. Oh, it's right like this, right? You have the pipe. So you take out the pipe and you just go like this and you line all this with stone. So you have a wide uh, level spillway, if you will, from the pond. It's about at least 50 feet. Excuse 50 me, feet line, line the piece that you've taken out of the berm Same with down. stone? So Correct. just widen it and stone the sides of what you've just, what was the berm? I'm just trying to understand what you're So right now you have an earthen berm. Yes. It's dirt. And it has a pipe in it. Yeah. And we remove the dirt above it. Remove the groove of the pipe that's gone, and we excavate to the invert elevation. So let's we'll say the pipe had this. So we're going to take this part of the berm out and level it to here. This part of the berm level it to here and line it with stone so that it is is, is not erosive. Fifty feet is probably wide enough because that's about what the stream is at its widest uh, up above. So I think that would work. Actually, it's a little less than that, but so. So one, this takes going wider. Does away with the pond? No, no, the pond would stay. Okay. At the so present, the, the, you're cutting it down, but not all the way to the bottom of the pond. Correct. So the pond would stay, and I'm, I'm going to guess there's going to be an average of two and a half to three feet of water still. Now, the, the benefit from that, I looked at it two ways. One, what's the risk of trying to recreate everything? Uh, that's some risk. But also, you're creating a refugia for fish. So during low flow conditions where there's barely a trickle uh, in, the, in the brook itself, there'll be a nice place for a refugium for fish <coughs> and for obviously other, other critters too, amphibians. Um, there's green frogs there already uh, all over the place and there's gonna be more of that. And it's also gonna attract other wildlife, you know, and 
when you do a, a wetlands functions and values assessment, you look at wildlife. One of the questions that the functions and value assessments always ask, is there any open water? Is there a stream? Yes, we have a stream. Is there open water? Now we have a little bit of open water. So, and it's along a riparian corridor. So it's, my main issue is steep slopes, and we need to widen out that uh, berm, cut it out so that the, the stream can flow without erosive forces and create a problem. Um, wood chip worm obviously has to be removed. And in going back to the pond, what I would say is once the, you relax the slopes, you topsoil to the extent you have, some areas don't have proper topsoil, so you might have three or four inches. You have your erosion controls, obviously, because you need those. Um, you seed it, part of the seed mix that I recommend, it's, it's those, you, you've heard it before, it's the New England Wetland Plant Sink from Amherst. Fairly expensive. Um, we put a little more effort in putting uh, about 15% by weight of annual ryegrass so you can have quick germination. Some of the other things take a little longer to, to germinate. Um, and then we're going to do some shrub plantings, but that's going to be a little later. Um, the same thing is going to happen in the wood chip berm uh, driveway. It's all going to be removed to the original topsoil. And by the way, I've recommended that I have to be supervising uh, both these activities. I'm, going to, I'm not going to camp out there, but I might visit TJ in the morning and say, hey, what are you doing today? I'm going to do this. Okay, here's a few things to think about. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of hours. So he does some work, come back later in the afternoon, supervise, make any adjustments, and then discuss the next day. And so I might be here every day that he does that, but maybe for an hour at a time, just to be sure he's tracking correctly. And that will, that's usually what I do with these kinds of things. Um, seeding with the very expensive <laughs> New England wetland mi wet mix um, underneath this, because basically everything's dead. I mean, there might be a few things that have survived that might pop up again under three feet of, of wood chips, and they've been there for a while. So I expect some seeds will probably pop up, but proper yields are probably gone. Uh, so we put the seed mix in, and then we kind of monitor till the end of the season to see how, how things go, and if we need to actually come in with plugs, then we do that. Um, I also expect that we're going to put shrubs along the edges of, of the pond in that zone that now is this way, that we're flooding at least three to one. But I didn't recommend what those would be yet, because this is a disturbance area, and, and so I want to see what's going to pop up by itself. Uh, we might have some invasives to take care of in those areas that have been impacted, and then come up with a plan that we can uh, either plant uh, shrubs before uh, the end of June, or then go to September. You know, you want to avoid, obviously, in July and August, you're going to have to be out there with a spigot. Yes, you do have a pond, I guess you can put a little pump in and do that. But, if you're very motivated, you would do that. But um, TJ's, he's got a business to run too, so I don't want to make it over burden from him. So if he can plant shrubs, and, and once we do this original, the first phase of the remedial work, and we come up with a planting plan, I expect there's going to be at least something in the order of uh, 50 or 60 shrubs, uh, similar to what's there, but I think I'm going to try to uh, increase the biodiversity by some things that are not there that would be perfect along the pond. What I'll be looking for is things that are clonal. That means, well, we used to put uh, arrowwood. We still might have a little problem with arrowwood and, and the bugs. So, but there's other things like uh, sweet pepper bush. Uh, those are clonal. You put two and then they start filling things up. So viburnums, uh, some of the dogwoods that are already there, and then some more upland species like American hazelnut, some of those kinds of things. So I'll come up with a plan, 50 to 60 shrubs, and then I have to go around the pond. I, th I think that's the estimate that I'm figuring out. And then once we remove the, uh, the wood chip berms, even though I don't think there were many shrubs before, we're going to do a few shrubs along the upper edge for that, uh, just to kind of fill in a bit. So I'm estimating another 25 to 30 
kind of staggers along uh, that edge. That's kind of the, the thumb sketch of it uh, for me, and uh, I wish Kate was here. <laughs> Me too. Yes. <laughs> because then she will probably throw in her little tweaks that I'm sure she has been thinking of. And I'm knowing Kate, whatever she comes up with, it will be fine with us. Excuse me. That's you. Anyone have any questions so far? Has everyone had a chance to look over the uh, letter that's written? Yeah. By the way, I have a bunch of pictures here. If you're interested. Oh. Here's a panoramic of uh, the offending uh, road in Delaware. And you can see it at the end of it. So it's like a, yeah. Sorry, you don't probably have enough. We can see. The first packet that I'm going to give you is actually saying. Yeah, that's the book she I, I took some pictures. Picture. Oh, 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 there. Okay. Yeah. So the first one's had to do with the roadway. Yeah. Those. There it is again. Uh -huh. I'll give you an idea of what's there in case you haven't seen it recently. That was the first how big it was when I walked out. Yes. Yeah. 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 What are we looking in this last picture? Is that the roadway you're talking about? That's the wood chip. Yeah, so yeah. Road, road, yeah. I'm on the okay. far side, so towards the pond. Okay. Looking back. Backward. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, so the other thing that Kate yeah. wanted me to tell you is that when I did the delineation, I passed the, the roadway and started going kind of in a northeasterly direction. And she wanted me to keep going with the delineation, but I looked at it and you know, walked a little bit and said, it's all at the, at the bottom of the slope. So that's what I said in the report. And you know, I put like three flies and made it quit. Um, again, the, the, the wood chip firm. Just a bunch of similar pictures looking from, from different, different angles. Yeah, the, the next ones I'm going to quickly show you are from the pond. And again, no particular sequence to these, just... That, that accumulation of water next to the wood chips, is, is it in the nature of a vernal pool now? Or is, it just, um, is that just a... That I don't think, or, that, what is I don't that? think that was ever... Yeah, there's a little bit of a compression right there. Yeah. Uh, and you're right, I did hear... Uh, a couple of wood frogs in there, and I didn't see any uh, head masses, but again, I didn't look very carefully. At sure. it. it doesn't smack to me as a you know, classic vertical pool situation. So I didn't. I didn't go. So the, the next sequence is the pond, and I think one of the things you can see that um, is my concern about the slopes that need to be addressed. No top, so yeah, you know, kind of rocky, rubbly stuff that might not be conducive for uh, a lot of vegetation growing quickly. <laughs> so. There is so this is the oh, this way. Yeah. So this is stream coming down this way. Right? So when the stream comes in, there's a two foot drop. Right where these trees are basically? Yes. So so there's a drop. We can't see that, but there's yeah. a drop. So uh, then, I mean, that's another thing that we need to address. At least make sure that it's not going to continue to be broken. And so there, honestly, there's probably going to be some tweaks. So I'm going to have to walk TJ through 
not only just the general scope of what needs to happen at the pond, but also, you know, like the entrance of the stream that has to be armored a little bit. Who puts the cell fence up? Uh, that was under the direction of Kate. Okay. Yeah. Can you find out where the, the berm is on the pond? Um, yes. Oh, okay. So, if you have this this picture, this is the stream coming in, and the berm is all the way to the other side. So, um, where those bunch of silt fences are, that's where the berm. Okay. Thank you. He, um, TJ was saying that he uses the wood chip um, roadway, you know, to get to the other side. So. Um, do your plans include another entryway, or is he still yeah. use that? Initially, we were looking for another entryway, right? And there was more than enough. There's already a crossing of the stream, right? Just about uh, 300 feet up. The right, because we saw all the maps of that. Yeah, original. you can. I don't know if it's in that photo, but you can probably see it as some of the other photos. There have been some developments. Yeah. Um, the development was that. See if we can find this. Yeah. You can't really see it, but there's a 1986 aerial photograph, and there's a crossing right in here. You can see the little swath mm -hmm. that's open. I'll pass that along. So that's kind of where we were going with this. And then TJ decided he's going to sell an entire field to the farmer to the south. Since you already don't need the entry. Right. So he's he doesn't want to do anything with that. I think he's going to keep cut out a lot on the far western portion of the road there. Okay. So he's going to try to cut a lot up there, which means he's going to have to sell it and or come before this commission if he's going to do it himself. And the rest of it, however many acres, he's just going to he's a, he has an agreement already to sell it to the farmer. I don't know if it's happened already. Because the farmer has been using, I mean, he's been leasing that land anyhow and using it, so kind of makes kind of makes sense to make it official, I guess. But that's as far as I know. I don't know. More than that. That's what I heard. Oh, this and, and this photo here. Yes, sir. You're saying the uh, the inlet of the, the pond is here. Mm -hmm. On the far side of the river. So, and I think, you know, one thing I didn't take, a, I took a picture, but I didn't print it, was the color. I apologize about that. Okay. Well, I, can you see it right? Is that the end? Yeah, that's right there. Yeah. 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 Have you analyzed, there seems to be a lot of uh, debris on the edges of where he excavated and moved dirt. I mean, is there a plan? Is that going to stay there? What's your thought on that? Uh, if you're looking at the south and north part of the pond, um, that's kind of dirty soil. I mean, it's not, it's not proper for, for planting. But that's stuff that he pulled back. So that's where the gravel and the water was increased. Yeah. So when I dug there, that was existing upland soil. So mm -hmm. he, the, the boundary was here, and he just pulled it back to, to say there, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 feet. Looks like he took out some pretty mature trees if that if yep. that stuff was all on the side. Yep. Okay. And then there's and some kind of structure here. And so I, I, I stand corrected. I did say shrubs. We're going to plant some trees also. I have my brothers up to have a couple of symbols. <laughs> <laughs> now, these trees here, I presume, are going to die because they're in the water? Ah, I will let you know if that's the case. Heaven, um, I didn't look at them right now. Let me see if everybody knows what they're doing. Um, they're red maples, most likely. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're water power. More water power than most. <laughs> They are fine. What's the structure behind the cell fence? It looks like up there. Like a the tree stand or a tree house? It's a tree house. Is that in the. 
I forgot all about the three house. Is there ever mediation in the three house? Is there in the wetlands? Is there no, in the no, upland no. review area? What is that? Yeah, it's in the upland review area. So will the pond be, uh, is that in the property that's going to be sold? No, the pond's going to remain. Me. It's going to, which is good because there's going to be a, uh, we're going to monitor this year and we want to monitor this okay. year. Is, is this part of the pond? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And is, is this the inlet? Um, no, I'm on the berm. Oh, oh. So okay. this is where the... Hello there. Hello. Hello. So the pipe is hidden. Oh, okay. Mr. Logan, can you just expand a little bit on why, what the downside of eliminating the pond and re trying to return the water course to roughly its original uh, boundaries? What, what's the downside to doing that? The downside is you're working within the water course itself, so you yeah. there's an elevated risk that you're working in a wet environment you could have. Yeah. That in, uh, Detrimental to what you want to have to wait and say at the low flow period of July, August. Yeah. Then you're still going to have some water and the potential of the storm hitting through. You can't really put your ocean sanitation in the water without doing big stuff. So usually when you do something like that, you, you want to put your sump on the upside. Yeah, the very good water. Pipe, yeah. Yeah. Bring it all the way around, remediate it, and carefully bring the water in. Um, because otherwise you're worried about set downstream sedimentation, right? Yeah, although honestly the downstream uh, wetland is not particularly sensitive to sedimentation. Really? Yeah. But there is, there is, there is a little, still a little bit of a, of a stream that you know, has similar characteristics, maybe another 100 or so feet before you get into the flat. So when TJ was doing his excavation in this area, he must have stirred up a lot of sediment, yeah. and there must have been a lot of erosion downstream. Yeah. Did you there's see? A, there's a couple of, uh, uh, you call it sand bank, sand bars, yeah. Yeah. just downgrading of the berm itself. I don't know if you saw that on, on one side. Any idea how far downstream the uh, his excavation had an effect? Um, what's the next river? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. But, uh, what is this float to? Salmon, salmon, salmon Brook. Salmon yeah. Brook. Yeah. This would be Salmon Brook, which has recently got wild and scenic designation. Cool. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I did a little work in. Uh, East Granby, Granby, Tower of um, where the where the winery is, mm -hmm. just about it is the other side of the river. I love that stretch of mm -hmm. the road. And following the wood turtles, they've never been followed before. Mm -hmm. First, they were there. <laughs> <laughs> and on one hair is really possible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> maybe we should add to the list that's something I forgot to do. Just to go, take a look at that sandbar that's below. Here, we move it by hand. It's not particularly large, it's probably from the air to So that would be what? 15 feet between from me to Katie? Something like that. Is it still on his property, the sandbar? Yeah. I think, well, if this is property, as I said, he's going to. Put a line through and cut it off. Give the rest of the farm. Oh, but I don't know what that means. It's in the cars. And, and, and my understanding of May or May. It just seems like it's right. It's, right oh, okay. it's contingent it's upon it's another sale happening um, yeah, on Day Street. Street. And if that doesn't happen, then the farmer acquisition of it will happen at the same time. That's it. So, um, I mean, all the pieces got to fall together. Yeah. Mr. Logan, my fellow commissioner pointed out to me that there, there seems to be some kind of abandoned cars or oh, yeah. vehicles. Yeah, the wetland that, it's, it's the parking lot. <coughs> yeah, is that in the wetland, out of the no, wetland, out of the wetland review? What's your wetland review? 100? 100 feet and it's from the wetland boundary and 200 feet from the water course. So it's so probably right at the edge of your wetland. Oh. Yeah. And you're well, oh, quite a bit of that field because yeah. of the water course yeah, the, boundary these being 200 be feet in, right? and yeah. 100 feet from the edge of the wetland. The mm -hmm. field that's disturbed is all 
primarily, like I think it's up to maybe the barn is all up in the review area. So. Um, Do you know the? Maybe we can pass this down. I have, I have one. Yeah. yeah. There's a there's some cars and oh, I have the camper party wagon camper. The party. Is, do you know if that's in the Upland Review area? It is. Oh, it is. So there's two hundred feet. So, so I have a bunch of uh, thoughts. Good. <laughs> I'm not sure what you already done. Had a few thoughts, so I'm <laughs> we just went saying. over Mr. Logan's mm -hmm. thoughts, but I was wondering what your thoughts were about why why is it better to leave the pond? You know, we understand opening the berm, getting the pipe out of there, and then sloping the edges better and revegetating. But what's the downside risk to trying to get the water course back to roughly its original? Um, Shores, you know, banks. You know, I personally think you could go either way. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of what kind of disturbance you're going to have. Again, um, and as Mr. Logan's letter stated, we've actually gained wetland area through mm -hmm. this activity. So, a we're gaining a resource area and square footage on resource area. So that's a positive thing. Um, and in terms of biodiversity of habitat types, and um, George is a great one to speak to that. Um, you know, that gives a different type of habitat within that stream channel to be utilized. So as long as, my, my only concern would be, in, and this would need to be done during construction, it might need to be modified post-construction if we find that the stream channels flows during, you know, July and August when it's low flow. Um, that pond actually prohibits the natural flow that would normally be going through there because we're going to have that kind of a riffle weir um, on the backside. So the culvert would come out, there'd be a riffle weir. And, and creating riffles is also a good thing because it oxygenates the water. And, um, so it's not a bad thing. The biggest concern for me would be not having it maintain flows as it, as it would in the past because you have the ponding structure there. So as long as the Weir elevation is going to be lower than, um, you know, upgradient where the where the stream channel is coming in, so that you're you're making sure you're always having some flow and just that excess uh, quantity of, of area is going to have standing water or, or ponding water. In the pond. I'm not a hydrologist, but you know we have a pond that's I'm calculating about 2,350 square feet. Um, the volume of water say to an average of three feet, two and a half to three feet, even with what we're thinking, and 175 acres that are bringing water to it. I'm, I personally think you're going to be fine, that it's going to be enough water coming through the system so that you don't have a embayment and then no flow following down. I think it's always going to flow. And I think the key to that is construction. You know, how is it constructed? And I think if there's a professional on site to direct the homeowner, which I believe will be doing most of the work themselves or from, you know, folks that they're um, in contact with, then um, then it could be okay. I'd be worried about leaving any of this work under the pure supervision of the homeowner. I think a professional wildland scientist and soil scientist needs to be available during these sensitive activities, and that was some of the comments that I had had. George does have it in there um, that he would be on site during the pond uh, restoration activities. Correct. And what I was explaining to the commission earlier is that I'm not going to go out and camp there, but I'm going to be there at the critical times. Usually for these kinds of things, I'll come in in the morning before the work starts, discuss what work is going to happen, um, then leave, come back in the afternoon to see what the work was, make any additional recommendations, talk about the next day, and then so on until, I don't think this, this work is going to take more than a week if he's motivated uh, to do it, and he has help. Um, and from the looks of the people that I saw there, he does have a lot of people that are in the similar business of construction and so on. So I think his friends with equipment, but again, they have to be supervised to make sure they don't create a bigger problem than restore. So to circle back to my question, you said you were you could be had either way in terms of restoring it to the banks or putting the pond. But it sounds like the upside to it is we've increased the wetlands area, we've created refugia for brook, it sounds like brook trout and other fish, and of course the macroinvertebrates and you know, mayflies and everything else in that pond, which 
and then maybe you're attracting other wildlife, which increases biodiversity as well. Yeah, maybe maybe an occasional waterfowl coming through. I don't know. You know, it's kind of a small area, and it's treed um, in terms of a landing zone um, for anything larger. But, and, you know, I liken this to um, completely different, but it's very similar in my mind. You have a power line. And you would think that these power lines, because they're cleared, um, and they can't have any trees growing, are not the best habitat. But in reality, they're fantastic habitat because you have an edge habitat next to a forest, and then all the creatures are utilizing the forest edge to then do their hunting and foraging. Um, you can have the nesting that's happening adjacent to their feeding areas. So by creating more diverse of a landscape, you can accommodate for more different uh, species to utilize the area and you know even vegetative species would want to um, have more biodiversity in that way so you know taking the culvert out I think is essential because that's a man-made structure there's no reason to go across it I talked to TJ about it he has no reason to be going over there um, I was very strong uh, worded with TJ in terms of if you're gonna need to go back there this is the time to give yourself that access. And he, unless George, you've had additional conversations since that time, the desire to maintain any access that is, you know, for any kind of vehicle to get back there is not um, what he's looking to achieve through this application process. I mean, remember before, up uh, back here, I'm gonna get shot by the gentleman up there. <laughs> you can take the speaker with you. Oh, I can. That's fine. Right. Um, Is that okay? So, before there was a discussion on the table of him possibly selling the, the field uh, to the farmer <coughs> and therefore not needing access, what we had done is there's another little piece of land that he owns that's a little square. I don't know if I had sent that to you originally, Kate. I don't think I have a copy of it. But if he ever wanted to have a, a, a roadway, um, he could probably squeeze something into that, some swing down south, get into that area, and then cross very close to his property boundary. At that point, he's, he's impacting wetlands again, but only for a little stretch. And then he's in an upland area. And then he could go through the woods and connect to the existing crossing that's between the two fields. If he ever wanted to do that, uh, that, I think that would be something he would have to come back and talk to the commission about. Or we can talk to him now and see what, what his inclinations are. Yeah, um, because we're extending these permits for up to 10 years. So if something doesn't happen and he's going through this effort, if it was me, I'd like to have my door open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and not you know go you have a professional on board you know get the, the design process taken care of uh, the impact analysis taken care of and um, but again it's not a necessity even if it comes out then we just have to come back for a separate application. Yeah, I mean he has a delineation out there, so that's that's good. I mean, I don't think it goes on to that small square property, though. Correct. The, uh, the wetland does touch the. I think the way that I saw it touches the the top of the. Um, here. So when you're showing me the the light blue line there, which is your boundary, correct? Yeah. And then it goes down and below here. That's what you're you're speaking of this location here, correct? Yeah, so you can come down here and then nick this. Okay. So. Um, and you did look beyond onto that property to see if there was any kind of other wetland areas that might be an issue. Well, I can say that I've looked within 30 or 40 feet. Okay. Yeah. So I might have I might have to take a I might have to take another look to the far side of, of that parcel just to be sure. I don't think there's anything there, but then again, I can never say never because <laughs> yeah. I've been surprised before. And it's very, very dense in there, so my thought is that it's probably not. I mean, it has the invasives. Um, but if he wants to do that, then I would think it would be good to clear that. So 
Maybe you're saying that upstream there's a uh, crossing that he can get into this field. Yep. No. Okay. So pretty much, if you remember, it was approved right. crossing mm -hmm. for previously. Yeah. It would be the same thing. So you could almost take the plans that were approved and submit them with some refreshed information. That's because Mitchell was already on board with that about seven years ago or something of that nature. I'm not much privy to that. I haven't. Seen, I've seen some plans in his garage, but I don't, I don't have any copies of them. Yeah, the town hall has copies of, of that approval. It is expired, though. Right. So, if you guys uh, had wanted, I had made some notes about um, the review, and um, I know George sent me over the fee schedule that he was. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, did you bring a copy of that? I did not. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I did. You know, I, couldn't, I couldn't even. I think the bottom line is we had 5,050 um, square feet of, of impact of various types. Uh, so that was times 0 .04. 0 .04, point oh four. Point oh four. Yeah. Phone, you're right. And then <clears throat> I wasn't sure if there was. But there was one stream crossing, so that's two hundred dollars. Right? Yeah. So it sounds like um, between now and the next meeting, we'll need to go over the fee schedule together mm -hmm. and make sure. Because um, when I was going through the calculation of impact numbers, um, we just want to make sure all that's accounted for in there. Okay. And um, so that's one thing we'll we'll have to work on sure. between now and next meeting to make it a, a full application. Um, and I think, you know, when this was originally submitted, you know, George was not aware that this was going through as an application. Um, it, it is in the notice of violation that we did expect an application to be submitted. So um, that's why that didn't come in at the same time. And I think you sent that out about 3.30 today or so. And right. I gave it a quick glance, but I just didn't have the time to really get into it um, with that late notice. Um, the other things that I was noticing that were not part of this, which I think we might need some amendments um, to your presentation, would be the uh, front area where the brook uh, or the water course um, comes through the property in the front over by 189. Mm -hmm. There are some disturbed um, soils there, you know, sand pile. Uh, having a final restoration plan about what's going to happen there. Um, and then back again to the trailer area and the equipment storage area and the wood processing area. Those are all located in the upland review area and they're relatively close to the wetland boundary. So uh, as part of it, I'd like to see a presentation on how this area will be stabilized. Um, you know, the, the big open mass of soil that's there in the upland review area that's all contributory to the wetland resource areas and um, a timeline for that stabilization. Uh, I think that's something that, you know, should be first and foremost, but it's a really big area, so I'm not sure in terms of probability of them getting in enough material to make that happen. You so mean the area that's becoming the barn and that's flat? Like they, I guess that was not flat at one point, and they made it flat, then, I guess, so. Whatever it is, it's all exposed, so um, that definitely needs to be addressed because that's in our upland review area, um, and it's you know potential for erosion. Um, this is between the barn and where the wood processing and that other stuff is. And was that actively excavated or was it just trampled and moved because of the majority, vehicles? The majority of topsoil was removed. Yeah. I don't think it was removed. Uh, perfectly in a neat fashion. And so I think there's still some topsoil mixed in here and there, and some subsoil mixed in with the topsoil. So you know, it can be reapplied, but I don't know if, when it's applied if it'll be um, organic enough to maintain a good herbaceous layer. So that should be evaluated to make sure how that's going to happen. Um, then again, back to the things that are back in that area. The one thing I was delighted to see when I went out for inspection probably two weeks ago at this point was um, things are coming out. Some of these boats and whatever else was jammed back there is coming out and it, and, and it seems that they have the intention to bring more of that out. So um, I would like some clarity about 
what's coming out. Um, I don't particularly like the fact that they're storing um, quads and snowmobiles and things that contain um, hydraulic fluid and oils and things of that nature right next to the resource areas. When you have such a large lot, I don't see a reason for that. And most of those don't look highly uh, utilized, so I think that there could be a better place to locate those, and I think that that should be specified in this application where that's going to be done. Um, right against the wetland boundary, they have a tr uh, wood processing area, and um, my biggest concern with that is um, moving around. You know, if they're going to be processing wood and it rains, and they're moving their equipment around, and then they're going to muck it up and cause the soils be to become exposed. So I think specifically showing on an aerial photograph where they're going to keep their wood processing for the long term. Uh, I'd like to see everything 50 feet back from the wetland boundary so that we have enough space that if something does um, get mucked up by operations that the sediment can be retained by a uh, permanent herbaceous layer that's between what they're doing in the wetland resource areas. Um, you know, trailers. I think at a certain point all those will be going, but specify if those are going to be going. Uh, when I went out there, there was a piece of equipment moving. When I first came out, I was like, oh, geez. But it was okay. Um, because <laughs> he was taking the wood chips and spreading the wood chips so that the soil was stabilized. Now, I had a conversation in regards to the wood chips not being greater than two inches in depth because that would inhibit the um, vegetation from, from coming up through. So I think that would need to be detailed in the letter so that it's very clear where wood chips can be applied and how deep they can be. Um, because they're still working around that trailer area, I think it's very reasonable to have a thick layer of wood chips right there right now. But as they pull out of that area, um, those wood chips will need to be removed so that some vegetation can grow and there can be some soil interaction. Um, supplying us the uh, cubic foot calculations of the fill. You gave us the numbers, but if you could just detail out the cubic feet that was placed in these areas. Um, and then we have the impact areas on the plan, and we also have them throughout your report, but if you could just give that into a table format, I think that'll make everything easier to see, because uh, we have some additional wetlands, what were wetlands, what's now a pond, what will be a wetland again, uh, you know, and how much is the upland review area. And I had a number in the notice of violation, and I took it from uh, an aerial photograph on Google Earth and just a rough calculation, which will need to be revisited. Um, but looking at the upland review area for the amount of square footage that has been impacted was about 70,000 square feet. How many? 70,000. Well, the thing that I wasn't clear about is how far out here up in the review areas. The under feet is obviously not that what I was mm -hmm. having in my mind, and, and that was the one area that I was weak and trying to figure out. But it that's is, something we can certainly discuss. Yeah, and it is in our regulations, so everything's very, right. very well presented in our regulations. Um, now, you have stated here with the remedi uh, remediation activities, I think it was... Um, 4D. So um, it's leaving it a little obtuse about what's going to be planted and where it's going to be planted. Um, I think we know at this point where shrubs are and where shrubs are not. Herbaceous is starting to come up, which is good. So I'd like to see something a little bit more detailed about, you know, we had the um, clearing area, wood clearing area. I think you had about 460 or 500 square feet. Something like that, yeah. So if you could propose a listing of shrub species um, and a planting density for those shrub species mm -hmm. within that area, I'm assuming that's the area you're looking to. And not only that one, I think I was also thinking that, you know, if we, if we keep the pond and relax the slope, that that would be a nice area for, for some shrubbery also. Um, and then also next to it, which is that area that got a little messed up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I was telling the commission before you were here that I was estimating probably something in the order of 50 to 60 shrubs would do the permit of the pond in that area. And then I thought to myself, yeah, we should probably put a couple of trees in there too, since uh, some trees came down during this operation. 
So I think, um, if, you know, because we're, we're wondering if some shrubs are going to make it, you know, you're not going to want to be, if there's, if, you know, you say 50 shrubs and you find that you already have some re-sprouting because they were just buried, then you're not going to want to put a shrub there. So what I've done in the past for these type of planting plants, they'll specify a density where every 10, 10 feet, there will be a, plant, a, a, sh a shrub planted or some type of woody vegetation. And then that way that can be modified in the field. Um, and I think giving a listing of the variety of species and the percentage which should be trees and the percentage which should be shrubs. So I don't know if it has to be very exact um, where there's going to be six winterberry, uh, you know, seven red maple. I, I'd like, I think leaving it open ended to some extent like you recommended, but saying, you know, of the total, there'll be shrubs that will be planted within the 600 square foot area in addition to this other, calculate the amount of area that you'll have as a slope to revegetate um, and what the planting density should be in these locations and what the percentage should be of shrubs versus uh, trees and what the um, listing of viable uh, species to, to work in these areas would be. And then that way, you know, the applicant and the owner has an idea of you know where he's going with it as well, and and then if anything, it, it may be less than what you're specifying because there may be already some other shrubs or trees there that reduce the density that's yeah. required for planting. So my plan was I, I knew that this was going to go to the next meeting because there's still some question marks, and I wanted you to, to finish your review. Um, my thought is so we have now a month or so um, for me to get out in the field again. <laughs> Some, sometime in the interim to see what's coming up, what's popping up, see what the conditions are, be able to then put my little table together of potential native species that could go in there in some densities. So at least we have a target, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that item, uh, the water course down near 189, you said? Mm -hmm. Is that that one in the southeast corner? Near where that big dying tree is? Correct. That's a different water course, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. It goes under, the, under uh, what's the name of that road there? That's a bigger watershed. That's the road in... Uh, and and what, why do we have like any tree concern with that? Maple Island. Uh, as a, why are we concerned with that from the work that's been done on this property? So if you look over there, there was kind of a bulldoze looking factor that happened up front, you know, like oh, push okay. some materials around. And I think it was just part of cleaning up the overrun property. You know, I don't think it was done with any malicious intent, but I think just trying to clean everything up, there's, it's not cleaned up around oh. the water course. And the house is really close to the water course too. Um, the what is it? The, the structure. Yeah. Oh. So, um, and now that I'm saying that out loud, um, he's talking about potentially having that structure removed from its foundation and relocated. So we may want to add provisions into the application for how that area would be stabilized if the house was removed. Mm -hmm. the, big, the big farmhouse? Yeah. yeah, the old house, I think, is what they were saying they were going to remove. There's a new house that's on the back side of that that I think they currently live in. Correct. And he wants to leave the new house and remove the, the historic home. Somebody has a, a bid in to take it, is my understanding. The oh. question is if they actually take it is, is the question. But um, but if it goes, I mean, that's part of our upland review area, and it's going to be a soil disturbance that's going to happen. It's going to be, I don't know if there's a foundation under that house or if it's just a crawl space or what it is, but something's going to need to happen with that within our regulated area. So we'll need to know. Um, the ultimate plan for that location and maybe having a um, demo plan, if it's not a removal plan, maybe it's a demo plan, you know, having alternatives so that everything is in there and everything's planned no matter how it goes. Um, now, um, you had in there discussions about the water course. If you can give us a calculation of the linear feet of water course that was disturbed. Um, I didn't see that in there. Um, it should be easy enough. Let's see. Um, and you were, so the whole other reviewer, what we're doing with that. Um, the sandbars, how those will be removed. You know, I'm thinking with a shovel and a bucket yep. Yep. by hand, where it'll be placed. Um, Not back in the wet. 
completely do. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and I think, you know, uh, as part of your oversight, the commission, or at least I'd be looking for a email report within 24 hours of each site visit with a photograph. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be anything extensive, but we need to be in the loop about what you're seeing and what you're, sure. and how it's progressing. So I think, you know, having all this in writing prevents us from um, having to condition it quite so much. Mm -hmm. So if you're able to give us all that detail, um, It'll make the permit issuance a little bit clearer. Otherwise, we can also, also add it in as conditions of approval. And then the last thing I would have is, do we want to consider this a significant activity? I would go to a public hearing. We are bulldozing through a ballot. Uh, I would consider it to be pretty significant. Mm -hmm. OK, well, we'll schedule a public hearing next meeting now um, I'm thinking about this we want him to get things stabilized and by going to the next meeting appeal periods things of that nature we're really pushing this out we'll, we'll be past year I think it was June 15th date we had in there of getting this done mm -hmm. But with a notice of violation, can't can't we approve some interim steps while we while the appeal period runs? Because we you know it's an application, it's a larger application. We're talking about uh, some issues. If they if we include the removal of the historic home and the activity and the other water course as part of the application, those things may not happen for a while. So it you know we can I think with a notice of violation, can't we in our policing powers say, well, you need to do this in the interim? We can't. The only thing that makes it a little confusing is that we like to do notices because we like to keep it friendly and have people come in for yeah. a permit the way they're supposed to. We don't have an official order. We didn't, we didn't, issue. We didn't issue an order. We didn't have the public hearing immediately following. So, you know, that uh, vehicle is kind of informal. We've left that informal. So, um, you know, what may make some sense in this situation is maybe having an interim meeting where we schedule our public hearing in two weeks, or even less because we don't have to worry about an appeal period to move things along. Well, we, we have to wait at least 15 days anyway, right? Well, that's the appeal period for a public hearing. We're going to be making this a uh, public hearing anyways, so we don't need to worry about that. Oh. And correct me if I'm wrong on that, but oh, that's know. a petition for public hearing. Oh, but if we already schedule one. Yeah. And there's no petition. Just uh, uh, what is, what's the notice period for the public hearing? Um, <laughs> Do <laughs> you're, you're, you're talking about having a public hearing in two weeks. Or, yeah, what do we need to notice it? Fulfilling the notice requirement. I think we can do it. Quick. How can you schedule it? How can you notice it if we're going to do it in two weeks? We have enough time. Oh, yeah, I think it's. You just have to put it in the newspaper. Notice yeah, it I hearing. think it's just, a, I don't think it's two weeks. Okay. I guess we better find out. Right. So, published twice in a newspaper, having general circulation, there must be not, no less than 10 and no more than 15 full days between the date of the first notice and the date of the hearing. So we have to jump on it. Mm. Seems awful tight. So, yeah. no less than 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're talking so about at least three weeks from today. I mean, realistic. Yeah, we're really not. you're not going to get anything done this week. Yeah. So your Monday would be your earliest, and then you need 10 days via that. So, I mean, we're not, we, we wouldn't be moving forward much. So we're talking about two weeks from tonight? Three, three weeks. weeks. Three, three weeks. weeks. So, so that's the Wednesday before Memorial Day? Yeah, it's basically the Wednesday before our next Wednesday meeting. Is it Memorial Day on our meeting? 
No, I'm just saying this no. three, is three weeks the Wednesday before Memorial Day or would it be the Wednesday after Memorial Day? And it would be the 29th. The 27th, right? It's early. So, okay. Yeah, it's, I think it's the yeah, 27th. So Wednesday after Memorial Day. Yeah. After. Two days after. Yeah. And it was the 29th. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that if, if the applicant is going to move forward as soon as possible, that to give, give him an extra week uh, would be important at this time of the year, since he's coming up against, uh, you know, plant deadlines. So if you were to publish one, they have to be, if they leave it to be two days apart, the, the publishings for the, so if you were to publish one on Monday, and then two days, another one on the 16th, and then you have to be 10 days. That makes it 26. And then since we're under, Two weeks, we count weekends, I believe, when you count days. When you're over two weeks, you don't count weekends. Yeah. What's the 26th? That would be the day before Memorial Day. That'd be Sunday. 27th is Memorial Day. So we'd be on the 29th. 29th, and that would be a solid two weeks before our meeting. So that'd be, that would be helpful to the process. Yeah. And that's if everybody wants to hang out on the 29th. And then he's got two weeks to the next meeting, right? Yeah. Correct. So if there was anything else that needed to be taken care of, but and if we can, you know, open and <coughs> close the public area in the same breath as well, before we get everything buried mm -hmm. in ahead of time, yeah. and we're both quite on the same page. We'll be on the same page. <laughs> no worries. Because <laughs> then, because then the appeal period can be taken from that point forward. So the, the 29th would be the public 29th hearing? 29th would be the public hearing. Yeah. So then we would have two weeks to our next meeting, and that would be the appeal period of 15 days. Okay. All right. So between now and then, the what I'm taking home for me is that I'm going to bump them up all these little additional things that need to happen. Um, so we can add to the application some, some of these additional activities that need to happen. Hopefully review area, um, the planting plan, the tables for the impact areas. We'll discuss the, uh, the fee s uh, schedule, the fee structure, um, and whatever else. I mean, we can communicate via email. I'll put a list together of what I heard tonight. Okay. And then you can say add, add K and L. <laughs> so, with the timeline, wouldn't we want like a plan for construction at the same time, so we had some kind of dates and times to effectively enact the project if it is approved and things like that at the same time, since we're running so tight with time. Yeah. Well, George has already um, put. I think it was like I said that June fifteenth, everything was to be removed. Um, so your next meeting is on well, your June meeting. Point, it would be June right 12th. around, yeah. So, so it would only give them a couple days to. And that would, you would hit the appeal period. It would be working its own risk. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess this is something that we should discuss also beyond this application about how we're doing enforcement. And, and do we want to be keeping with the notice or do we want to just go right to an enforcement order and, and uh, let that be our vehicle moving forward? But for this, um, you know, I think with the schedule we're setting up, and if things go accordingly, they can still hit that June 15th deadline for... For certain things, and some things can probably go to June 30th yeah. for planting, and then we have a lull, and then we have to wait for planting for, for fall, unless we put a little pump in a watery can yeah. or whatever. So as long as it's very clear mm -hmm. in your write-up, you know, what are the target dates are. Okay. Um, That's the other thing that I need to do is sit down with TJ and say, okay, here's what we have to do. Are you around? Are you going to commit? You know, well, this week this has to happen, the next week this has to happen, et cetera. So I need to have a heart to heart with him and be sure that he's on board with, with the schedule. And the way that we operate, um, and we've operated in the past, is 
you know, even though it's a permit, they have the permit. It's not a, they're not required to do it. Um, they're they're asking to do this work, right? So when you have an enforcement order, right. um, then it's a requirement. So we have like no leverage to say if he doesn't meet the dates, then then he, then he gets served an enforcement order with. You know, and that, that's when we can enact. That's what we've always have done is we've given them the opportunity to to maintain their own compliance, and then if they don't, then we force the compliance by issuing an enforcement order when they don't comply with with what was given to them with the the permit. So it's a little more friendly process. Yeah. You have a friendly process, but and we'll probably use that schedule. But you know, obviously, he has to do this thing where he will get an enforcement order. Right. Mm -hmm. So we can always talk about how we want to move forward in the future doing these kind of things because it might be just easier doing the order and, you know. Yeah, particularly because it took them so long to retain Mr. Logan. Now we're really, this is really taking a lot more time than we wanted. Yeah. And, and, we're, and we're going out of our way. Or in right. Yeah, to, to I mean, we're doing an extra meeting for this yeah. and, you know, it could this could have been handled considerably earlier. Mm -hmm. We're talking four or five months in between now and when we actually found out about the violation. Right. Yeah, there was a little bit of a disconnect in the beginning between you and myself and my wife. No good deed goes on. Yeah. <laughs> That's a mess. So depending on what other questions you folks may have um, for Mr. Logan while he's here, um, I would recommend taking a vote on whether or not it's a significant activity and why you're considering it a significant activity and then um, a vote on the date for the special meeting and to have the public hearing. Um, and then anything else you feel necessary. You need a motion on that? Okay. I make a motion that we consider it a significant activity. There's reasons, and one need only looks at the, uh, the record that's been provided by uh, Mr. Whitty's consultant to see that there's been significant disturbance, not only within the wetland area, uh, in terms of an alteration of, uh, of a, a water course, creation of a pond, uh, stripping off of vegetation and topsoil. Um, there's uh, additional disturbances in the upland review um, area, all of which needs to be remedi remediated. So by necessity, it's going to be a significant, um, it's going to be a significant activity. So I just made the motion, but I also set forth the basis for our determination. And that's, you know, that's just scratching the surface as to what happened here, what needs to happen. <laughs> Okay, any further discussion on the motion? Okay, there are none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, we'll um, set up a special meeting and uh, get up. The 29th. Sounds good. The 29th. Yeah. 29th. We have to set that by motion? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I make a motion that we set a special public hearing, a special meeting at which a public hearing will be held in conjunction with Mr. Witte's application for May 29th. Second? At 7. I second. Jason. 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 And the only other thing I can say, George, at this time, um, just looking at your your figure, mm -hmm. uh, figure A, I think um, just from working with this property owner that the writing is great for us to understand what's going on, to refer to the details about what's going to happen. But I think on some type of uh, figure, it should be very clear removal, you know, re uh, topsoil application, new location for wood storage, because, sure. um, you know, some people work better, I, I think. think. make it look a little more official, mm -hmm. like it's just so, kind of someone would follow if I was around. Yeah, like, so, you know, if, if he's sitting there going, what am I supposed to do here? You know, it'll be on, you know, a plan versus just in writing. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's no, you know, disconnect between the writing and, and the sure. plan for clarity. Do that. Okay, we, we we have to vote on the uh, motion for the date. All in favor of the 
29th of May at 7 o'clock, special meeting. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Mr. Chairman, one other thing. We've had a lot of submissions tonight by Mr. Logan, including his preliminary recommendations. Um, I'd make a motion that we make those part of the record in this application, you know, so that they're available to the public to review prior to the public hearing. I, I don't know that we need, uh, probably it's a good idea to do it by motion. Um, so, second. so anything that you handed when I was I, I know I have your submission, but those photographs. Yeah. photographs. Yeah. We're going to go to Microsoft for the annotation, so you're not going and saying, what is this? Which way am I looking? Right. right. Yeah, so we'll give right. a chunk that we received tonight, and just for the, and for the record, since and they I, were presented to the commission. I put all, all the ones I have and I into the, the uh, official folder here. Well, you want, you want to put them all in, then we'll make sure we get Yeah, them. just put them all in, so we'll sort them out. You can have mine. A photographic memory. Does there have a copy to help you get any back? Do you want any back? No. Okay. I'm good. They're all we only need good. one set in the file. Whatever. Sure. All the computer. I'm not going to do much set the music. No, I'm just giving them all mine. Just in case. All right. Okay. All right. I'll make it a point. I move the meeting be adjourned. But we didn't vote oh. on we didn't vote on the last motion. Oh. To make the, all of the submission oh, okay. from this oh. evening as part of the uh, record in this in the application, so that they're available for the public hearing. And somebody second it. I think yeah, you guys both yeah. 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 Okay. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, time I see you all, I'll be here. Happy birthday. <laughs> see you then. <laughs> right, what else? Do we have? Do you have anything else, Kate? Okay. Um, really, that was that's all that's really going on. I mean, we have the the, the Wells Road Solar is still in process, um, so they may be coming back in front of us when they get a little bit further along. Um, uh, getting out to do some uh, we, the permit was issued for 15 Bar Campstead. The, the modification there that was issued um, on the 15 Bar Campstead. I was looking at that. If you look directly across the street, they did a bunch of excavation right against the brook. Oh. And then there's a big pile of soil sitting there currently. And there's, there's, like there's no so you may want to take a look at that. Uh, sediment erosion control on that. Just because I was looking at the one. So. Yeah. All right, so across, directly across. Yeah, across. I mean, there's a bridge right there. So you go over the bridge. They're on the corner of, uh, what's that, Route 20? And uh, 219. Okay. And, and what does it look like they've done there? It just looks like there's some excavation done down by the brook, and there's a large pile of soil sitting right next to the brook um, recently. And could you see why they may have wanted to do this? I mean, maybe they were making a flatter. I mean, I drive by there, so I wasn't, I was doing 35 miles an hour. Yeah. Activity nearby or something? Yeah, I just saw an excavator there, so that caught my eye, and then I see the pile of material there. There's nobody there now working, but. So, if this is a violation, <laughs> it's a great time to talk about this. <laughs> How you guys want to operate, if you still want to stick with the notice, getting the permits, let them comply, then issue an official order, or do we want to work well, everything under the order? I mean, that kind of simplifies things. What's the downside with giving them the order? Um, well, it's not as friendly, you know what I mean? It's not as much uh, the Granby style of, we want to work with you. Um, and we have to have a, we have to have a public meeting immediately thereafter. Let me, let me pull up the language here. So we have to convene uh, in order to issue this. 
So this requires a little bit more paperwork on our part. Um, give me two seconds to just get to that part. And regulations. that a person conducting a maintained activity facility or condition which is in violation of the act of these regulations we may issue a written order by certified mail return receipt to such person um, to meet and cease the activities and then within 10 calendar days of the issuance of such order the commission shall hold a hearing to provide the person an opportunity to, to discuss so we do have something happening on the 20 million <laughs> well, uh, yeah, speaking personally, I'm not sure I'm ready to abandon the friendly approach yeah. that we've taken yeah. in the past. However, it does feel like, particularly with you know tonight's, you know what we saw on this particular application after a friendly notice issued, it's almost like we've rewarded in a way back behave, bad behavior in many levels, uh, and you know maybe as a commission we need to relook at that you know in the future i'm not ready to abandon our friendly ways but put a, but we just put a time we just I mean, a time them. Yeah. something this is, you know if you we know we don't hear something within a permit to last week. no no exactly. this is this is a different oh this is totally street. different oh, the street. oh okay just say it was in relatively okay. the same area but if you issue the notice of violation you can still do the order after right correct right. Yeah, so that's just a notice of that you have a violation. So the one, so this would be the bonus if we have an order on this. So as part of the order, we can require of the permit application. And then what can happen is the restoration activities, to put things back to the way they were, can all be completed under the order. So we could move those things along faster instead of waiting for these time frames to go by. Now things that were additional, um, proposed activities, they would need to have the permit for those. So, um, you know, having that order in place, we still could request that they actually file the permit application, do the appropriate fees, go through the whole process, but if we needed them to start moving on something right away, we have an official order in place which allows us to allow them to do these restoration activities like stabilizing soil. To meet the timelines, especially yeah. with the planting season. Sure. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think it could be a benefit um, as long as it's perceived properly, you know, in the town about our reasons for wanting to move forward in this new manner. Um, because then at least, like on this site, we want you to get out there and start stabilizing all these exposed soils. Are, are, you, are you talking in favor of an order or this notice? Mm -hmm. so are you t what you're saying sounds to me like you'd like to see us go right to an order. Oh, okay. I just think, you know, um, it's, it's more binding, A. Mm -hmm. So if we ever have any issues, there's less lag time on us getting reactions. Um, and going straight to the order allows us to allow mitigation work to start as quickly as it needs to. Um, you know, we, we can do stabilization work right now, right? But the actual applying topsoil and, you know, regrading all that big area, we, we don't have something that's allowing them to do that at this point because they don't have an order to work underneath and they don't have a approval letter. So I do think we could have a little bit speedier compliance. You know, now if they want to put a shed up or if the reason why they were doing it is because they want to clear it for a lawn, you know, that's something that you need an approval for. But to put it all back and get vegetation to grow on it, we can work on that through the order. So it gives us, a, I think we can get some speedier recovery on things and we have a little bit more teeth if we ever had to move forward in a different way. Okay, well, why don't we think about it as a commission for a while? And yeah, we'll you know, I think most towns it. do it by, by order. Yeah, just I think to, you're Just right. to move it along. Grambian, at least in my experience, appearing before commissions in other towns, we do have a user-friendly procedure here. 
which is great. I mean, that's what Grammy's about. But mm -hmm. there are times when you really do need to have an order and act. And I think this may have been one of those times. That's what I was driving around thinking. Yeah. From one day to another, I said, you know, if we had the order in effect, we could yeah. have them going to do these particular yes. items right. and getting ahead of the game. So in, that's in less than five months. Exactly. So, you know, I mean, maybe this should be our, our new routine. And when they come in, we, we give them the friendly feel. <laughs> You'll be right with a friendly tone. <laughs> it's in your benefit that, that you're getting this versus just doing this. But um, yeah, but then that re requires us to convene within ten days. Yeah, so, but we can yeah. always work that accordingly. Um, Time is ten just days done. before right. the before regular meeting, meeting yeah. and you're all set. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other business that anyone would like to bring forward? <laughs> Hearing nothing, I entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. <laughs> there a second? Second. A professional second. Right? <laughs> <laughs> all in favor of adjourning the meeting, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.